At big fashion schools like Parsons and Central St. Martin's, graduate collections can be a spectacle for fashion enthusiasts, media outlets, and even buyers that are looking for upcoming talent. It's a display of total creativity and often becomes foundational in the designer's early career. So today, we'll be doing a five-year reunion with five designers that graduated in 2018. It's gonna be a really fun one. Welcome to another episode of The Curriculum. I'm cheating a little bit with this first designer, but Ding Yun Zhang is too unique to miss. Technically, he's a 2018 grad, but it was his bachelor's, not his master's. Ding Yun Zhang is a Chinese designer from Beijing who was originally inspired by basketball shoes and artists like David Hockney and Robert Rauschenberg. He decided to first pursue fine arts before landing at CSM for both his BA and his MA. It was during his BA where Ding was given the opportunity to design for Yeezy, where he helped design the Yeezy 700 and other experimental silhouettes that remain unreleased till this day. When we look at Ding's BA collection, it feels very reminiscent of his work at Yeezy. We see this especially in the color palette and the overall stylistic choice. And given that it was his first collection ever, it's really hard to blame him that it feels Yeezy inspired after being thrust into this guy's world before he even graduated his BA. However, there are definitely aspects of this collection that are unique to Ding. In this collection, Ding aimed to highlight the contrast between luxury and necessity, which was inspired by Jackie Nickerson's photo book, farm. The book captures portraits of workers from the global south, dressed in clothing rooted in utility. This relationship of function-informed dress is exactly what Ding explores in his first collection. Throughout it, we see a lot of oversized silhouettes, camouflage prints, and utility pockets. It's no surprise that the puffer jacket is everywhere in this collection, something that later becomes signature to Ding. The fabrics in this collection are also dyed by Ding himself, and given this treatment of gray wash and sheen, that make the garments feel rugged. It's like they've already been through this harsh condition even before getting on the runway. I think this is a core part of the collection, a commentary towards the fashion world's obsession with utility for the sake of vanity, even though it isn't crucial to sustaining our living. Ding subverts this hyper-utility through exaggeration, with some looks having more pockets than one would ever need, and other looks using 3M reflective material even though they're camouflage print. It's inherently a contradiction of functions. These motifs of exaggerated utility and oversized silhouettes are continued and improved upon in his MA collection from 2020. We won't be diving into that for time's sake, but please go check out Fashion Lover 4's breakdown of Ding. He's got a fantastic channel especially if you're a fan of Kiko Kosteranov. Five years later, Ding has become the ultimate feature artist in fashion. He bounces from brand to brand that continues to blow up our feeds on social media. Let's start by taking a look at his 2022 collection with Montclair Genius. By this point, Ding's name has already become synonymous with puffers, which is no surprise that Montclair tapped him for their Genius program. Here, Ding moves away from using specific references that we see in his BA collection into what he calls the ambiguous themes of the deep sea. Although the reference materials seem thematically different, what remains is still an examination of the relationship between the person, the clothes, and the environment. Ding once again presents us with this exaggerated, hyper-utilitarian collection that at times feel either overprotective or contradictory, like this puffer jacket with holes all over. I actually had the chance to try on this Montclair Genius collection in New York City when they released. Beyond the absurd price point, and I really mean it, it's absurd. Trying on these jackets made me feel like I was wearing a uniform from that mission in Interstellar. It was this outerworldly experience that I've never had before, and to be honest, it was amazing. But just as we thought Ding was about to establish himself as a one-trick pony in puffer jackets, he co-designs these sweaters and jackets for Marnie's Fall Winter 2023. Ding has once again brought his touch of oversized puffercation to a collection. And although no longer alien-like, these ballooned sweaters are certainly uncanny. I feel like Riso brought on Zhang to bring back some of that utilitarian irony. I mean, these sweaters look almost cumbersome to walk in. Maybe I'm reading too deeply into this but I believe that the original ideas that Ding presented in his bachelor's collection is still present in his work today. Laura and Deanna Fanning might be the coolest duo in fashion right now. The Australian twins did their MA at CSM, Laura hailing from women's wear and Deanna from knitwear. Collaborations on graduate collections aren't super uncommon, but they rarely materialize as full-fledged co-collections. Their master's collection focused on the armor and chainmail motifs of the late 1960s Italian space age, 
Films like Barbella and Tenth Victim are their references. The Fanning sisters took these references and examined the shapes and colors associated with them to create a collection of futuristic glamour and bold femininity. We see elements of patchwork, exaggerated shoulders, and checkered prints. The collection simultaneously glorifies the colors and glamour of those space age movies while subverting the tropes of the tabloid girl from that period. For the Fanning sisters, a glamorous woman is an epic, intellectually powerful person that celebrates their physical presence. This will be important later, I promise. Overall, the Masters collection shows the sisters' boldness and their ability to pull from obscure references. It's no wonder that they were tapped to be the creative heads at Kiko Konstantinov Women's. Did I say Kiko? Kiko Costadino? Did I get that right? Arguably one of the most exciting fashion brands out there right now. I don't know who's arguing against that, but I'm here to argue for it. Also graduating from Central St. Martin's MA fashion program just two years before the Fanning Sisters, Kiko Kostadinov became known as one of the London fashion scene's best kept secrets. The brand grew a bit of an underground cult following because of Kiko's unique design sensibilities. He introduced new shapes, silhouettes, color schemes, and references into his collections while still making the clothes very desirable and wearable. He had a very unique perspective on menswear, and when he brought his skills to ASICS, him and his team created some amazing products in collaboration with the shoe giant, which really shot Kiko to the spotlight. Upon researching the Fanning Sisters MA collection, the connection to Kiko was clear. The shapes, colors, and patterns bizarrely follow Kiko's design canon while still being distinctly women's wear. I think it's fair to say that both designers, well, in this case all three, have very similar outlooks towards design, which allowed the Fanning Sisters to seamlessly join the Kiko Kostadinov brand. Kiko Kostadinov had only been a men's wear label up until their appointment. So the women's line has and still is the full responsibility of the Fanning sisters as Kiko decided to mostly focus on menswear himself. And they've done a great job maintaining a similar visual aesthetic to the men's line whilst still exploring various unique ideas around women's wear similar to those that they demonstrated in their MA collection. As I continue to learn about women's wear myself as I've mostly focused on menswear, I find myself revisiting their collections and really appreciating their approach which is distinctly colorful, daring, but still complex and offering a lot of very wearable stuff, which I think just describes Kiko Kostadinov as a brand in general. So it's a perfect match. Taking a look at their Spring Summer 23 collection, we see color blocking, chainmail-esque knits, and overall boldness that's also present in their Masters collection. The collection's overall theme is derived from mythologies, not to romanticize them, but to critique our overall reliance on myths as opposed to individual emotional expression. Australian artist Mirka Mora is also core to this collection. Mora was famous for her bright, expressionistic, and fantasy-filled works that tackled personal and mythological themes. I think the Fanning sisters draw from Mora for two different reasons. The first is more obvious, which we can see in the collection's overall color palette and the makeup on the models, which parallels Mora's work. Moreover, some of the looks seem to directly reference the clothing seen in Mora's paintings, which we can see in these collars. My second point though is more about Mora's legacy, which I think is core to the ethos that the Fanning sisters are trying to bring to the Kiko brand. Mora remains an important cultural figure and icon in Australian art, not only for expressing herself in her own work, but also hugely impactful for the development of Australian contemporary art. Mora is thus a perfect example of what I mentioned earlier about the Fanning sisters having a glamorous woman in mind when designing clothes. I think this is how the Fanning sisters have truly innovated Kiko's brand, bringing a value that's authentic to themselves that we can see all the way back in their master's collection. I'm cheating again, but this time for the amazing Elena Velez. Velez graduated from Parsons in 2018 with a BFA in fashion design and moved on to CSM to continue her masters. She's known for her designs that capture the soul and angst of the American heartland, playing out in the glitz and glamour of the New York Fashion Week cycle. Velez's senior thesis is titled And Carry On, visualizing the persistence and rebuilding from the post-apocalypse of World War II. From the outset, Velez has been all about process, emphasizing slower, conscious, and authentic fashion. Her thesis collection deals with the repercussions of conflict, self-imposing her designs under the material constraints of wartime garment industry, part of what she calls aftermath industries. 
What makes her early work so special is Velez manages to conceptualize a path forward after humanity's self-destruction. Architectural, rusted metals frame her clothing, sticking out from the fabrics like rebar and rubble and debris. At the same time, they act as scaffolding on her models, implying this element of reconstruction in this post-war world. Her use of metals alludes to her background and where she's from growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was once known as the machine shop of the world. She uses sheer silk from salvaged parachutes, elegantly flowing in jumpsuits and dresses, converting the military into the magnificent. Repurposed canvas with its edges still fraying emphasize the rawness in her clothing. Salvaged trims line her halter tops, twisted metals form her lingerie. Her thesis is simple, human tenacity in the face of adversity. Velez succinctly visits these pivotal moments in American industry in one collection, the wreckage yet industrial rejuvenation of wartime, the glory and decay of the American Rust Belt. Five years later, her Fall Winter 23 collection is titled Year 3, How's My Driving? This collection thematically comments on what she calls the romanticized abstractions of middle America. A specter is haunting Velez a morning in the Midwest. Let me set the scene. Dizzying electronic music and an eerie sci-fi Jason short film form the backdrop of the runway. Avant pop artist Earth Eater opened the show stumbling and charging down a pitch black warehouse in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Spectators describe the model's gates as a trance-like, in a daze or in a fury. It's like Velez took a page out of Antonin Artaud and his theater of cruelty. Artaud's expression is a gripping, powerful storm that demands the attention of the audience. It's inhuman, shocking theater meant to discomfort and disorient the viewer in order to get a form of communication without using words. And Velez uses the theater of her own collection to express the trauma around coastal interpretations of middle America. The reoccurring theme of metal in her bachelor's collection is definitely less visible here. However, we see torn and frayed fabrics return. This rotting knit skirt and this cut up dress showcases fabrics used to the end of its life cycle. Moreover, oil stains and paint splattered boots recall references to her aftermath industries. The biggest change within Velez's brand over the last five years is Velez directing focus onto more wearable and practical silhouettes. She describes it as turning raw art into something that can exist in today's fashion economy, which is something that's necessary for the sustainability of her label. Velez, in spite of material constraints in her first collection and business constraints in her latest, executes an enticing sociological analysis of America's heartland, which is something really rare and exciting to experience. Ray Zhou is a Chinese designer known for her semi-sheer knitwear pieces that champion the phrase, the power of fragility. Before Zhou started her own eponymous label, she graduated from Parsons MFA program, winning multiple awards along the way. Zhou's graduation collection titled Close Up is an examination of knitwear as a medium and the relationship between garment and skin. The collection features nine ethereal knitwear looks, driven by Joe's interest in the beauty of imperfection and contrast. We see this throughout the semi-sheer knits with cutouts that are sometimes soft-edged and sometimes sharp. The contrasting nature of this collection is also in the materiality, where the soft knits are accompanied by the spiraling metal wire in beautiful contortions. In a press statement, Joe talks about the theme of interpersonal relationships that are built into the brand's DNA. Just thinking about knitwear as a medium makes me think about connection, where interlocking threads come together to create the fabric. However, through Joe's work, she also shows us the complicated nature of relationships by fragmenting the knit through cutouts. Every layer within the styling is like a new layer of skin, like a physical manifestation of the idea that we grow thicker skin through life's experiences. Ray Joe's work also reminds me of American artist Senga Nangudi's work. Nanguti is famous for her performance art involving nylon and pantyhose, which she stretched, knotted, and filled to assume human qualities. Her work often speaks about the endurance of human bodies, in particular, the female body, evoking the entangled and restrained restrictions placed on women by society. Joe seems to reference two aspects of Nanguti's work. For one, Joe seems to evoke Nanguti's idea of stretching and manipulating fabrics to comment on the female body. 
However, instead of talking about restrictiveness, Joe's work seems to focus on the liberating factor of her fabrics, that all body types can wear it and feel confident in it. Secondly, she also adopts performance as a medium to showcase her work, using kimbaku in her 2023 presentation, which is a form of Japanese bondage. Diving deeper into Joe's Spring Summer 23 collection, we find echoes of her graduate work. This is found in the technical details, shown through contrasting sharp and hard edges on the knits, and also in her signature beading as connection points in the garments. In this collection, we find Joe revisiting conflicting emotions of vulnerability and power. This time, it's in her expanded accessories and jewelry collection, where Joe reveals that they can be used to either fight back or even hurt yourself during desperate times. The external world is where our bodies are both perceived and expressed, and Joe uses contrasting elements in her work to show that this is the case. This is what I think has changed the most about Joe's brand throughout the last five years. There's been a shift from general interpersonal relationships to the relationships that we have with our bodies in today's world. It's a relevant shift within Joe's brand and general culture and fashion, which is something that Ray states in simple terms, love what makes you, you. Thank you so, so much if you made it to the end. The feedback and support that we've received on our last few videos has been extraordinary. As always, like the video if you did, subscribe for more, and leave a comment down below on what you think about these designers. Follow us on Instagram to stay tuned with our project. Right now, we're currently working on trying to open a retailer here in New York, and we would love your support on that also. This has been another episode of The Curriculum, part of Commune's mission to talk about and promote thoughtful fashion design. We hope you enjoyed. Until next time, from us to you, please take care.